Welcome to Portal Talks, Episode 7, where we have Vinny from Pain Academy on the show. Vinny is a posture therapist located in sunny California, where he's put together some awesome interventions for those looking to solve their postural deficits. We talked for a little over two hours on this one and dive deep into postural issues, why they occur, the psychology and emotional effects on the body, and being responsible for your health programs. Um, I'm really pumped to share this with you all. So let's just dive right in. Let's just see, man, who are you? Uh, what's your background and all that good stuff? Yeah, man. So uh, my name's Vinny, and I'm the owner, founder of Pain Academy. And my background started when I broke my back. Um, I was a Division One athlete before that, All-American. I had a couple state records, a couple national titles, but I wasn't really passionate about fitness until I couldn't do it, like until I literally couldn't move. Um, you know, like I said, I was a swimmer and I went surfing and I was pretty good at swimming, but I wasn't good at surfing and a wave pretty much took me and threw me down on the ground. Man, it was, it was just one of those life traumatic events that completely shifted and altered the course of my life. Um, so, so that's what got me into the world and the realm of what I do now. Um, I, I could say I'm a posture therapist, I could say I'm a corrective exercise specialist, but it just, it doesn't do it justice for what actually happens when people come to, to my program. Gotcha, man. That's, yeah. where'd you break your back? Like where, like what, like lumbar, thoracic or? Yeah, it was, uh, it was at the T12 junction. Jesus. So it was a uh, fractured T12. The impact, I think it was a rock. I don't know because I wasn't really paying attention to my surroundings yeah. at the time. Um, it was an impact injury that fractured the T12 vertebrae there was a 21 degree shift in my lumbar from the force of the impact, which now I understand it was just due to the, the nervous system completely spasming out. It completely shifted my spine over to the side. So almost like a, a lumbar scoliosis from it. Um, multiple herniations, couple slip discs, 12 sublex vertebrae. I mean, it, it was just, it was a life altering injury. Yeah. Were you doing that? Were you still swimming at the time when that happened? No. So I, I, I got burned out and that's oh, why yeah. I wanted to pursue surfing. Cause I kind of got exposed, you know, I was a swimmer in Denver and I got exposed to this Southern California lifestyle with the long hair and the board shorts. And I'm like, I do not need to be freezing in Denver. And I was competing for university of Wyoming. So it's a totally different culture in Wyoming than, than SoCal. Um, and so I came down here just, you know, burned out of swimming, but I still wanted to do something with the water. And I just saw these cool guys on surfboards. I'm like, I'm going to be that cool guy. And I ended up just paddling out on a day that I had no business being out there. I felt confident because I was a good swimmer. I felt like there was no ocean that was going to teach me a lesson. Uh, but I was, uh, I was, I was wrong, humbly yeah. wrong. Yeah, man. Jesus. That's, uh, like you said, traumatic and I can't imagine that. I've ne I have never experienced anything like that myself. Um, now, here's the real question. Do you still surf? You know, um, even though it was now the best thing that happened to me because of how it taught me so much about myself and life and people and how to, you know, I didn't learn about pain from like a textbook. This was something that I couldn't like get off the ground. Um, it was the biggest teacher in my life, but I don't want to go back. Yeah. And, you know, I tried a few times, I tried surfing with some buddies and it was just like every single time when I would catch a wave, I would have that seized up fear and be reminded of what that was like. And it took so long to figure out how to even like move without debilitating pain that, um, you know, I got a son now. I just decided I would much rather buy the surf videos and live vicariously through them than, than put myself in that situation again. Yeah. I don't blame so, it. Yeah. Man. Especially in like, you know, those types of sports that are a little bit more dangerous. Like as I get older, you know, 
I think, and like having my own health insurance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Oh, which I didn't have back then. Yeah, like I think about like going. I don't know, like my buddy. He went and he <laughs> he rides dirt bikes. He's like, man, like you'd look good on one of these. You'd look good on one of these dirt bikes. And I'm like, oh, oh, hell yeah, that sounds awesome. And then yeah, I started really. thinking about it. And I was like, dude, if I get hurt and I can't work and I can't do all this, like, <laughs> so I completely get it. Like. <laughs> yeah and and that was hard because like i'm a i'm a thrill guy man i I love adrenaline i love Mm -hmm. like challenge and there's just no part of that business that i ever want to touch again yeah yeah man those uh risk reward right there like you gotta (laughs) weigh it out (laughs) but yeah but at least if it happens again i hopefully can streamline the process way way faster this time and it's not so much fumbling around hey man i'm sure you've helped out other surfers and all that good stuff but um how did so you broke your back. You have this, like you said, you kind of have like this scoliosis going on. Um, obviously, that's how you got introduced, I guess, to posture training. So did you do like all of this on your own or like? Well, the, the journey was, was probably really comparable to what most people, right? You have an injury, you go see a specialist and they start doing x-rays, they start doing MRIs, they start coming up with a diagnosis and then you start treatment. And you go to the physical therapists and the chiropractors. And I found some really great ones. Um, there were ones that helped, but it didn't fix it. It improved it, but it never went away. And this was, you know, I was a 20, 21 year old kid at the time, no health insurance, uh, paying out of pocket for everything. There was just no end in sight to what I was doing. And so it's not to discredit that. I just, I had to find a different way to do it. I refused to do the surgery, which was recommended. Uh, They recommended a fusion um, at where it was broken and where the lumbar uh, shifted. Otherwise they're just saying it's, it's too unstable. You're just, you're not going to have a quality of life and you're not going to walk. And I did that for a couple of years and I went through the system and I really tried to stick with it. I got a hell of a drug prescription. I tried to use it as much as possible because that was the only thing to get me through. And it just, like I said, it didn't really seem to work. I would go into these places. I would feel better. I'd go back home and it was like the clock started ticking with how long it was going to be until I felt the same. Um, And that's what led me to kind of this idea that there's nobody's going to care as much as I do there. Nobody's going to fix this for me. There's people that can help. There's people that can facilitate healing but the healing stops when you leave the office. And that's where I went down. Okay, well, let me see if I can get educated in this. So I did what most entry level trainers do. And they go look up the organizations like ACE and NASM. And I became a certified personal trainer. And I started learning more about movement and anatomy and really trying to put the pieces together myself. And it helped some, but I was just managing my pain. I wasn't fixing my pain. And so weight training seemed to make it worse. So I was like the scrawniest trainer in the world. I had a great clientele business. I love working with people, but like I myself couldn't re-rack the weights and I had to have my clients do it, which now I understand is great because they get to burn more calories, but like I still couldn't re I couldn't hold the dumbbells. I couldn't even teach the exercises. I was still in massive amounts of pain. So then I went down the corrective exercise route. Uh, corrective exercise specialist again offered through NASA and okay we're getting somewhere makes sense these asymmetries and these imbalances I, I resonated a lot with that I could almost feel what was in these books and I poured my soul into what corrective exercise therapy was got certified started to still working at the same gym just kind of carving out my own niche of I don't want you to get strong I want to fix you let the other trainers get you strong let me, let me see if we can heal. And I kind of slowly got better, but it wasn't with this just chaotic routine of stretching and foam rolling and therapy and all these exercises, you know, exercises to chase the hip and then the back and then the shoulders. And it was just a protocol for almost every issue that was wrong with my body. It was helpful, but it didn't really seem to create the day over day change that I, that I felt like was possible. And I was working with people and I'm training people and 
you know, these guys are coming in with a shoulder three, four inches higher. And I'm like, let's do push ups, right? Let's do bench press. And this is with a corrective exercise specialist certification I had. And this guy comes up to me and he's like, you should go to a posture alignment specialist. Go see my guy. Hands me his guy's card. And I ignored it because what the hell's posture therapy? Who cares? That doesn't sound cool. It's not a sexy thing to be, to do posture therapy. So I immediately just put the card in the back of my trunk and, and forgot about it. Things got worse. My injury got worse. The pain got worse. The movement got worse. I was, uh, if you've ever seen a cartoon where there's like a, a bucket with a hole in it and you've got the cartoon animal like sticking his finger in the hole and then another hole opens up and it's like now the whole body spread out trying to fix up all these holes. Right. That's what I was like trying to do corrective exercise therapy with my body. What's the course of time here? Like injuries 21, correct? Mm -hmm. And then like, where are you at like right now? Like how long? Yeah, you yeah. Great, great question. Um, so I, I fumbled through the system for about three years of doing the traditional PTs, chiros, massage, even went as far as like rolfing, things like that. Um, so I did that for about three years. And then I became a trainer probably when I was about 24, early 24. And then corrective exercise specialist about a year and a half after that. So about 25 is when I really start, and I'm 32 now, so it's about mm -hmm. seven years ago. About 25 is when I really started to dive into the depths of like what this stuff is and, and what corrective exercise is. Um, and so when I, was, when I was 25, that's when I started spending more time doing this alignment, corrective type stuff. And it wasn't until somebody who was a posture therapist approached me. He actually approached me because he saw me. And he's like, dude, we got to get your left knee fixed. And I give him this look like, dude, you don't even know what you're talking about. I broke my back. And he's like, no, you, you can't even like load your left leg. This isn't your back. It's, it's your leg. Obviously, ego went through the roof, got really defensive. You know, you don't know what I've been through, that type of stuff. Started injecting my story. And he's like, look, man, I don't want any money. I want you to come see me. Come see me for an appointment. And so I did. And we did a few positions. He didn't touch me once. Put your body here. Do this. Breathe like this. Put your body in this position. And stand up. And I stood up after, what, 30-something minutes. And it was like wait, wait a second. I like didn't have back pain anymore. We didn't do anything for the back. And it completely, I felt like I was Neo in the matrix, man. I got put into an entirely different realm. I had, I questioned everything, what I knew, what I thought I knew. It, it just didn't make sense anymore. Until you start looking at the bigger picture of the body and posture therapy. And that was my introduction to it. And I knew at that day moving forward, I would never chase symptoms again. I would never chase what I thought the problem was, get, was again. I am committed to being a posture therapist. And I was frustrated that this was like five-ish years in my journey. And not once did anybody ever recommend it. It was like this unknown hidden thing, posture therapy, that was the answer. But it took me going through so many different people to just even by chance fumbling upon it from a member in a gym. I mean, and, and so that, that just ties into my mission now, which is there's just this incredible therapy that's out there that nobody knows about, but it's, it's, it's just phenomenal. Definitely, man. I yeah. think, I think, especially when you look at these other types of like, like, like posture therapy and it's really comes down to those systems and their marketing, I feel like and true. a lot of times it's like, you know, there might be, you know, might have the most amazing thing ever, but like you said, it's not sexy. It's kind of like hidden in the background, right? Like you don't, I don't, you see some different systems and they're just like right in your face. Like you scroll through Instagram, they got the money and they're just promoting it like crazy. Yeah. Uh, so like I uh, do a lot with like postural restoration type, stuff and like the breathing as well and they're the same way like they're just now i feel like getting to the point where they feel confident enough in their systems to really start promoting and 
getting that stuff out there. But yeah, I mean, look, I, I back then I didn't understand why this was not a big thing. Like, how could something so damn effective be relatively off of everybody's radar? Mm-hmm. Um, and I considered myself in the upper realm of fitness. I mean, with what I was doing with my business at the time. Um, and now fast forward seven years after finding posture therapy, I get it. I run a business that is successfully helped people in 50 different countries. We're talking thousands of people have been introduced to posture therapy and how much friction there is in the market, taking people who have been conditioned to think in isolation, your hip is a hip problem. Your shoulder is a shoulder problem. That's what they're up against. And the guys who taught me posture, they're, they're not on Yelp. They're not in the yellow pages if anybody uses yellow pages anymore. good at marketing, to be honest. No, they don't care. Yeah. They, they don't care because they know what they know and that's good enough for them. They want to make an impact one person at a time. And, and that's just where a lot of these guru type guys are at. You're not going to find them on Instagram. They're not doing these wild poses and coming up with fancy names. But these guys, these underground posture therapists, man, the, these people are the real deal. And it's, it's saddening to know that it's not about efficacy. It's about marketing. Definitely. No, I completely agree. And even you just saying like, you know, it's, you're looking at the bigger picture, like where, you know, we try to speak to clients, patients, and we're trying to simplify and create analogies for different things. And I really think the main one that's resonated with people is like, your body's a car, like we need to fix this part of the car. And, but when we look at the system, like there's millions of years of evolution <laughs> that has gone into this that yes has, like morphed you and you know it's built to move and you have the nervous system and all these different things that are integrated into it and to sit there and try to simplify with just a poor analogy yeah it might get the point across in the short term but that person's going to take what you said and that's going to resonate and they're going to take that for the rest of their life. Yeah. It, 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 that's why when I got injured with like, I just knew I needed to go see a specialist who was going to zoom in and look at it as a back problem because duh, like, of course the back's broken. Why would it not be a back problem? Like it's, it's our introduction to the body as kids that sets us up for not even thinking posture therapy works. We're, we're screwed from early ages because we literally learn about, well, this is the nervous system and over here is the muscular system and over here is the digestive system. And we get really good at categorically breaking down this like complicated body. But at no point does somebody say, now let's tie it all together again. Right. And that is the biggest missing piece. And that's why I looked at posture therapy as being dumb. It was my misunderstanding of what the whole was and how the whole works as thinking that there's no way it needs to be complicated. It needs to be hard. It needs to be the nervous system doesn't interact with the muscular system in this way. Let's, let's fix the nervous system first. And then, you know, it's like the body just doesn't work that way, man. It doesn't. It's nice to think about it. And there's, and, and there are fields for each little, there's kneecap specialists, man. There's guys who devote their entire lives to a kneecap. That's every surgeon you've ever met. Like, they got their Yeah, and, and more power to them. Like, yeah. we need those people in trauma, accidents, and injuries. Yeah. Well, man, when I think of even surgery, like, I, like the horror stories I hear, like, the last thing I'm going to do, unless I've been shot, or I have like a wound or something that needs to be closed up, like, please take me to the ER. But when it comes to like a regular, like, oh, we're going to give you a hip replacement or we're going to do this or a fusion. I'm like, you're not touching me, man. <laughs> yeah. It, it, you know, and like one of the things that I try to empower people is why, why isn't it the other hip that needs the replacement? What am I doing that caused this hip? to be replaced. You can't tell me it's age because the other hip is the same age. Tell me why it's going downhill the way it is. 
And that's where the conversation stops because we're not asking those questions and we're not getting those answers from people. If there's one thing that I can do, my goal after this podcast, for sure, my goal is to start having everybody ask their practitioners and their people, well, why, 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 why? And if you do it enough, you're going to get to the answer of, I don't know, because that's just what everybody else is doing. Right. You know, it, it's, it's trauma specialists are great. If I have an accident, please take me to the brilliant men and women who know trauma. My God, I'm not going to do it with posture therapy, nor do I want anybody to do posture therapy if they, you know, have a, have a violent accident. Mm -hmm. um, but learning when to bring your body to a trauma specialist and when to bring your body to a movement specialist is like one of the greatest single pieces of information a human being can have. Because if you bring your body to the wrong person, you're, you're just, you're going to get the wrong result. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you're going to have a client list full of that. Exactly. Or you're going to be stagnant for how long? Like you said, you had three years. I know of myself, yeah. like I was about, I was two years stagnant with the same thing, just shopping PTs and Kairos. <laughs> yeah. You know, going down different rabbit holes and trying to figure things out. Um, and, and it's good though. Cause like, I think people need to do that. Like I recommend people do that. Well, um, a lot of the basics, I will say it does work at times for the right sure. person, but there sure. are times where it's like, I mean, I'm sure you can relate. And especially like you said, with the friction that's out there, it's people that have tried everything that come to you and they're like, dude, like you're. <laughs> like I've got you and maybe one other person that I'm looking at and then I'm giving up. Like I've got nothing yeah. else kind of deal. Yeah. Well, um, you're, I mean, look, you're, you're right. And if I would have broken my back and started off with posture therapy, I probably wouldn't have done it. I, yeah. I needed to see how everything else worked and in what ways it didn't work to finally come to this idea that, I'm the only person who's going to do it. What are the basic principles, not rocket science, but basic principles of how the body works and how can I give myself that self-care every day? I, I, for the first half decade of my injury, kept offshoring the work to the amazing PTs and Kairos thinking like, you're, you're going to fix this, right? I don't, I don't have to do shit. Like I can just show up and like, here's my money and you'll do it for me. And that's really honestly how most people think. And, and you need to keep paying people like that to understand until you shift that stimulus internally, it's not going to change the way you want it to. Yeah, completely. And, you know, I think the online realm really preaches that as well because it does force people because you're not there with someone. It forces them like they have to stick to the script. They have to do the work. And then if they message you in two weeks and they're like, what the heck? They're like, I'm not seeing your results. And you're like, okay, how many times did you do it? <laughs> Wait, I was supposed to do it on my own? <laughs> what? Like, yeah. And it, it's, I don't know. Again, it, that's a good point. Because when I really, you know, back to what you said about having to shop around and like get that experience, because I was in the same boat. Like, you know, I was talking to brilliant people and what I do now, I went to a specialist and it didn't work the first time. I literally like found on Instagram, I was like, oh man, like moved to Seattle, Washington. I found the closest person that practiced that type of stuff. And I honestly didn't put in my all the first round with it. And I wasn't seeing the same, the results that I was hoping and I gave up. And then I went down to other rabbit holes and then I came back to that same information. And I said, you know what? I'm going to do this every single day. I made it part of like a habit and I built it up. And then, you know, in a month, I'm feeling better than I have in my, like, <laughs> since I can remember. And it's like, yeah. how did that happen? And it's really just like, you know, I don't even care to people who are listening. Like, I don't care what you're doing. It could be, yeah, I think what I do is better, like whatever. But like, sure. if you're consistent with like Pilates, yoga, like whatever the heck it is, consistency is going to get you somewhere, mm -hmm. I believe. And it's just whatever it starts to work, keep doing it. Yeah. Well, that, that goes back to the friction, which is like, 
well, how long do I have to do this for? Right. And um, to go, you know, have to go do a therapy that you actually have to like commit to. We just want to get in and get out, have somebody go in and do the work for us. And now we're saying that, no, it's got to be self-care. It's got to be self-driven. People don't want to hear that. If, if I changed my messaging to quick fix only have to do for 30 days, oh my God, this business would have 10 X itself daily. People wouldn't get better, but right. it would 10 X itself because that's what people want to hear. And they want to see a movement that they've never seen before. Cause it's like gotta be super complicated to fix mm -hmm. their unique problem. Um, so then they just see people laying down on the ground. It's like, that's, and it takes time. No posture therapy. Simple nope. doesn't sell. It never has like, especially when you got, I'm sure you can think of all the accounts out there that are like doing exactly what you said. It's, there's a lot of just stuff out there. And when you start comparing the two, it's just like, it's like looking at the color tan versus like a crazy lush purple or something. <laughs> yeah. But in reality, like, you know, it's, it should be simple. It should be make sense. And if you're consistent, it's going to make results at the end of the day. Yeah, typically. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And that's literally just how, uh, and that can go into a whole conversation of how we're built and driven in the brain and <laughs> the psychology behind it all. But um, I don't know. So I am really curious to hear just kind of like, what does posture therapy entail? You're talking about like, you know, we're laying on the ground, we're kind of doing some different movements, 30 minutes, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, are we diving into like nervous system? Are we just stretching? Is it fascia? Oh, it's, it's, it's the human body that we're Can't after. categorize it, right? You can't because, and, and you can, like we, we can literally spend the rest of this time talking about the nervous system's involvement with posture therapy. Mm -hmm. We can talk about the digestive systems play in posture therapy. Um, we can talk about that it goes after the soft tissue, the connective tissue, the fascia, but none of that shit matters because if I put your body in this position, you're doing it with every system. Right. You're doing it with the one system, the human body. Now, everybody is going to experience that position differently. If you need the nervous system change, you're going to get the nervous system change out of it. If you need a fascial change, you're going to get a fascial change because these positions are what we are designed to be able to go into. If you can't get into that position, whatever quote unquote system is preventing you will be addressed. Like some people feel that the same exercise is calming and relaxing because their nervous system, their, their state is in such a fight or flight mode. It's calming. Other people are so tight with their fascial system that they'll go into the same thing and feel a stretch. Other people will have violent spasms in a position that should be calm because the muscles and nervous system doesn't know how to release. Mm -hmm. So everybody goes through the same program, but no two people go through it the same way based on however your systems are at play. And that is the most beautiful part about what posture therapy is and what I do is because it's not about isolating systems. We can like nerd out and talk about that, and we can get the specialist to try to make sense of it through their lens. But at the end of the day, we're talking about like Eastern philosophy. We're talking about Eastern therapy. We're talking about getting the body as a whole, not as looking at this as an individual system. So somebody with um, uh, degenerative nerve disease or chronic constipation or pelvic floor dysfunction or scoliosis or spondylolisthesis is going to do the same position because their human condition has been deviated from what function is. And that is where the battle sharply goes uphill because well, why would we look at the muscular system if we have digestive issues? 
why would we look at the muscular system if we have mental health issues? Why? Why, why would I look at my shoulders if I have chronic knee arthritis, bursitis, bunions, what, whatever? The greatest challenge that I have right now with posture therapy is not in changing the mechanisms of the body. And I think you've seen it because you've been following this account. People are doing crazy things on their own with no coaching, with just doing the program, getting in the positions and allowing their physiology to take over. But it's the mind that is just standing in front of everybody's way. And I've got an inbox full of like, hey man, does it fix this? Does it fix this? Does it address this? Is it good for this? And it's like, yo, this is for your human body. When yours doesn't work, weird stuff happens all the time. Insert whatever diagnosis is not, it's, it's there because your body's not functioning the way it was designed to. And that goes into really what I do with posture therapy is, is I address the system as a whole. No more zooming in. No more catering and babying specific injuries and making special population groups like do this if you have scoliosis or do this if you have a herniation. It's, it's a one system to get the whole to work better together. And that's a really big stretch for a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, huge. Dude, you're speaking my language, honestly. Like that's. Yeah. We're on the I, same page. We're on the exact same page. Cause and like, especially when you said like, I think, you know, the, the mind stands in the way of the body and the natural physiology. And, you know, uh, even the way I teach, like, I don't do posture therapy, posture training is what I call it, <laughs> but okay. or like restore restoration or like whatever you want to call it. What, when I help someone, I'm literally saying like, we're here to work with the body and, you know, jump started. And then this thing takes over. It figures it out. It wants to do this. It wants to have these capabilities. It's just a matter of getting it there and you being able to just do it. And step out of the way. Exactly. And then it takes care of itself. You're fixing and your body's fixing itself and everything that's going on. And like you said, it's just, it's hard for people to, either they want someone else to fix it. <laughs> yep. And it, it's crazy, man. But I really do like the, what you have to say about like, you're not targeting one system. You can't target one system. I mean, if we look at even like, I think a good comparison is like pharmaceuticals, right? Yeah. And they're saying how, oh, well, like we have this one medication that's going to target this one blocker, like a beta blocker. Well, how do you know that like, on this level, you're truly making a change? I mean, there could be another marker. There could be above or below it. That's just going to like, okay, you take this out and then they're going to scoop in and do the same thing or do yeah. something completely different. Well, that, that goes, you know, and look, obviously I'm not like anti drugs and pharmaceuticals, but because they help some people, but they don't address why they just don't. Mm -hmm. And to think that we can separate the systems. Yeah. If we really break down with reductionistic thinking, Newtonian mechanics. You break this into its parts, break those parts into other parts. We can look at, at how the genome works. We can look at the individual function of each cell and make a drug that targets that cell. But again, how does it affect the whole? Exactly. We don't know. Like we don't. We think we do because we see it on a cellular level, but the human body, like the brain, the, the just the body, People, human beings are the most complex organism in this world. Like we're, we're more complex than the technology than the most advanced supercomputers are. We, we don't, we think we know how we work, but we don't yet. Yeah. And well, so to continually, you know, chase the parts, it's just putting so many people in mental traps and it, it just leads people to, to run around in circles for a really long time, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It is unfortunate. And the whole 
reductionist approach. Again, it's looking at the car or looking at the body as a car. It's doing all this stuff. I'm curious what your thoughts are. I've been like playing around with this idea of like the language we use with clients. And, you know, I think especially in fitness and in wellness and therapies, everyone's out there, they're trying to market. You know, we have different terms for what an anterior tilt is. People calling kyphosis, no, it's excessive kyphosis or it's this or hyperkyphosis. Like there's no streamline of language. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, that's another thing that people just have to sort through <laughs> on top of, you know, maybe not feeling too hot and having pain. But I've been curious, like, I mean, I'm assuming you have like a streamlined version of what language you use, but do you think in the future we'll see like an overall, like better way of communicating some of these like movements or just like how to talk about like external rotation in certain different planes of motion? I don't know. <laughs> you kind of, yeah. Get um, I mean, here, here's the problem, man. Um, if we're even talking about kyphosis, we're losing. Mm-hmm. If we're even talking about the pelvis, we're losing. It's still reductionist. It's still reductionistic thinking. Like even in my last post, the thing went viral. It was the most uh, popular post I had. I talk about pelvic dysfunction, but I do that to enter the doorway of where people are at. So I can then say, you're not going to fix the pelvis by doing pelvic exercises. Mm -hmm. It's only when you address the ankles, knees, hips, pelvis, and shoulders that the pelvis could even change. And even then it doesn't matter because nothing exists in a vacuum. So when someone's talking about internal rotation and external rotation, we of course can go there because there is some value in reductionistic thinking to be able to test a specific joint's function. It's a tool. It's a tool that when appropriately used can help gain some information but if the tool is not collectively looked at as the whole we're just perpetuating the problem and and that um i don't think the language is going to get streamlined because it takes an incredible amount of energy to take a step back and zoom away how many conversations i've had about people sending me their MRI reports about their spine. And it's like, I don't want to see these. These don't tell me why your spine's hurting. They tell me the damage. They tell me the position. They tell me the medical terminology. But Mm -hmm. why doesn't this report have your ankles? Why doesn't this report have your knees or hips or pelvis or shoulders? The, The things that are causing the tug of war on the spine. Let's talk about that. And you know, to peel that question back even further, most anterior pelvic tilts are not because the person's anterior. It's because they can't go anterior that their pelvis is forced in that position. It's the lack of extension that puts somebody's pelvis stuck in that position. And and then you start introducing the the paradigm shift that's got to happen that um, if somebody's anterior, give them posterior stuff. If somebody has an anterior pelvis, well, let's work on doing posterior pelvic flexion type stuff. But that's not always the answer. Most oftentimes when somebody's anterior, it's because the hips don't know how to work with the pelvic and extension. So that's why it tips forward. And giving somebody anterior tilt exercises actually takes them out of an anterior tilt. Nothing exists in this isolated vacuum in which we can actually look at the pelvis and come up with a game plan or the hip rotation and come up as a game plan. And this is a conversation that I get into it hard because there are people who are pelvic experts. And the second you ask them, well, how many muscles connect the shoulders to the pelvis? The conversation stops because to them, it's all about the pelvis. And at no point could the shoulder influence the pelvis. And at no point could somebody's feelings influence the pelvis it's mechanical it's muscular so because we love making things complicated i don't see that language is going to be streamlined at all i think there is going to be anterior tilt specialists and people who 
have been told that there's an anterior problem, there's a whole industry that's going to be created on that. And I think people are going to make an incredible amount of money not helping people zoom out and understand your pelvis is not the problem. It's your body that doesn't work around the pelvis. That's the problem. Right. And, no. and that takes so much energy to challenge the status quo that people would rather the guys who know what they're doing, they're just saying, hell with it. I'm just going to teach somebody one-on-one. -on -one. I don't want to go up against that mainstream. Too much effort. Definitely. I mean, I'm sure you've made some posts before and you have to go through and either, I don't know how you handle it, but you just start block or delete or I've gotten into, I don't know, countless Instagram, you know, comment battles and it's, it's exhausting. It's like, man, like all I want to do is just like help people. I want to just provide information and I yeah. get consistently hit with where's the evidence, where's the research paper, where's this, where's that. And it's like, man, it's biomechanics. It's like, like, this is how the body works. And I'm just using that as my, how let's, I go about this. Let's go down that rabbit hole for a second. I've somehow, and I don't know how, I, I've had to only block about six people out of 88,000 people. For some reason, I think people don't question and get into it because of the results. Right. And I think people are very skeptical about what I do because they don't understand it, but they're not going to attack it because they also don't know what they do enough to be able to have good rhetoric, to be on the opposite end of the conversation. I think there's probably a lot of people who want to challenge it, but they don't because what you're, what are they going to challenge the body? Are they going what to challenge I your result? The, <laughs> yeah. The, the place I speak from is not, and this is where it's going to take a lot of like critical listening on this for everybody hearing this podcast. What I teach is not subjectivity. It is the objective truth of what the human body is, how it works and what it does. There is no anecdotal Oh, well, yeah, it worked for me. It worked for 10 other people. These are the objective facts, the hard truths that any human being should take a step back and look at. We are symmetrical. The right side should work like the left side. By design, by nature, we should be balanced and vertical. And that body is negatively affected by gravity when it's out of balance. That's what I teach. And so I think that because I come from that place, people don't challenge it because there's truth there and there's almost like a five-year-old's truth to where it's like it's simple enough to be like i don't want to question that that doesn't make sense but why i said let's go down the rabbit hole is because of the evidence evidence is a legal term it's used in a court of law in which two people have to come together and say this is what counts as evidence these witnesses these testimonies where is the glove right? Where's the smoking gun? That is the evidence. Where people get really confused is mistaking evidence for studies and thinking studies are evidence. And that's where the conversation has stopped immediately when people reach out. Where is the evidence? If you're asking, you're new to fitness. Mm -hmm. Because a true medical expert doesn't talk about evidence. They talk about studies. Seeing the E word evidence, when you really critically think about it, it is one of the biggest red flags that somebody does not know what they're talking about because they're using something that doesn't make sense. When you have evidence, it's a black and white thing. It's unarguable. A smoking gun is a smoking gun. There is no such thing as evidence with the human body. There is just studies that can shift people's opinion and depiction on what those studies are. Like, um, I'll give you a great example, and I'm going to butcher who did it. But in 2009, there was a study done with 109 or 111 people. I totally misquote that, but it's around there. And these people were split up into two groups. Half of the group had neck pain. The other half of the group did not have neck pain. There was no discernible difference in their cervical position. 
So the research, the study showed that your curve of your neck, the position of your spine does not dictate your symptoms because the people who had pain and the people who didn't have pain kind of had similar curves and positions. So here we have this study that looks at the body through a keyhole and says, well, the position of your cervical spine does not correlate to symptoms. Therefore, posture therapy is not effective. But posture therapy doesn't fix neck problems by going after the neck. Talk to me, about, like, why didn't they study the shoulders? Why didn't they study the articulations in the feet, knees, hips, and pelvis? The study itself was so biased, even though there were so many precautions set up to protect biased information, but still you're having the person who's studying it thinks of the body through a keyhole. And that study has been sent to me more than any other study about people saying posture therapy is bullshit because of this study. And, and where's the evidence? Well, the evidence is go stand up, go take your photo. Let's change your body position and you tell me what you feel, mm -hmm. right? Let's actually look at it from a mechanical aspect. Let's look at it from a relative aspect, a subjective aspect. I would not, I don't believe in evidence when it comes to the body. What I've studied has produced some pretty incredible outcomes and results. It is not evidence that posture therapy is great because I don't need evidence. It's the objective truth of what our body was designed to do. So maybe that was a little bit too much of a can of worms, but hopefully that kind of like makes sense a little bit about this whole debate of where's the evidence, show me the evidence, show me the proof. It doesn't exist with the body. I completely agree. <laughs> I mean, it's, and I know I'm sounding like a yes man, but I really do. Uh -huh. yep. Just because it's like, no, I mean, I've talked to multiple of my own mentors, shout out Zach Couples, Bill Hartman, all these other folks. But I mean, the same thing, you know, you sit there and you talk to them about even like PRI and some respiratory drills or like these positions. And it's like, it's hard to look at it past like a case study point of view because it's like, okay, well, they have shoulder, whatever, all this stuff going on. And then they did like one set or one script and it was gone. And they're like, well, how do we test that? Because you can't really look at it in a vacuum, mm -mm. right? Yeah. And then you go and try and look at, I mean, how old is the body in comparison to how long we've been researching it? <laughs> it's yeah. not even a grain of sand compared to where we've come from and when we started walking on two feet you know, or whatever that creature was. Right. So right. I, I mean, in the thought process, I mean, where I, like where I come from, which is physical therapy, it started in like 1912. That's, you know, a little bit over a hundred years. And then when you actually start to think about, oh, we're actually like gaining some ground and some credibility. It's only been like 20, 30 years that physical therapy has actually started to work to help people. Mm -hmm. and like, yeah, I think, I think the history of physical therapy was to help uh, veterans in, in World War II with injuries and, and to be able to like help them on the spot. I, I don't know if that can be quoted exactly there, but um, we're not talking about a profession that's old by any means. Yeah, I mean, like, in comparison to a lot that's out there or just medicine in general, mm -hmm. it's, you know, movement the study of it, kinesiology, whatever you want to call it, like it's still extremely young. And I think, you know, yes, I am glad that a lot of people are trying to figure things out and that they are, you know, I'm going to use the term evidence, you know, don't, don't, <laughs> no, no, no. But, you know, they are trying to like be obje objective about what is out there. And there is a lot of bullshit out there. Mm -hmm. But, I think that we do need to still, I think a good comparison is when we look at athletes, like we look at like LeBron James or we look at like 
Usain Bolt, like Usain Bolt, for example, you know, we thought that a good sprinter had to be, you know, in the five foot range in order for them to be fast and get the turnover rate that we wanted. And then here comes huge Usain Bolt and he's blowing everyone out of the water. So think about how many tall sprinters were out there that probably were turned away from the hundred meter dash. Right. Just because of a bias and what they've been told and just like a mindset. And, you know, you could say, oh, well, Usain Bolt's just an outlier. Well, why are all these other tall sprinters coming in now and they're challenging his times? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, is it our own bias that's really keeping everyone in these little boxes or categories, I guess? And uh, again, look at results. You know, Usain Bolt's the fastest man alive. That's a result you can't really argue with. But yet it's probably an outlier. But why not study that outlier? Why are they seeing success? Whereas all this other stuff, yeah, it might be evidence-based, but there's still all this toss-up of what's actually going on. Right. And, you know, let, let's even make it more complicated. Ooh, uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> pretty, I'm Do pretty sure, um, and I've only read this a couple times, but and to be determined if it's true or not that he's got slight scoliosis. So how can how can the idea of balance be true if we've got this guy who's the fastest man in the world and he's in balance? And this is where I beg people to critically think. We're not talking about there's a difference between performance and function. Definitely. And just because you get stronger and faster does not give you longevity. It does not mean you function well by any means. Most athletes successfully use dysfunction and their imbalance. Yeah, and their compensation. Sean White with how the guy rotates, he uses his imbalance to be one of the best snowboarders in the world. Think of every not, baseball player and golfer you've ever seen. <laughs> look at Tiger Woods' interviews before the most recent back issues that he's had. The guy's standing like he's in the final phase of a swing 100 percent. so we've got to critically think about am i talking about performance or am i talking about function am i talking about like competition outcomes or am i talking about what is going to happen to this human being over the next five or ten years when competition stops if we want to be the greatest in the world, let's completely get function out of the conversation and let's overtrain the body to specialize it and adapt to one thing. And it will only be able to do that one thing. But afterwards, look, look at the bodybuilders now. Look at Ronnie Coleman. I mean, I, I, my heart goes out to a man, but if you've seen a mm -hmm. special on one of the world's greatest bodybuilders, the guy can't even open the fridge without wincing his face because he's in pain. And he talked like, go, go look at the way he moves. These guys are hurting because they put performance over function. Right. And when you hear these studies and we're going to use the evidence word, let, fine, let's use it. If, if, if we're going to talk about the evidence, don't just talk about the evidence. I want you to speak of the people who did the research. What were they like? What is their background? What do they think? How do they view the body? And does that have any influence over the evidence that's produced? No, we read this Yahoo article. We see that it's got this name behind it and a study done, double blind, whatever. And we adopt it as the truth with no ability to actually question, well, who is this person? How many times was this study replicated? And how many times was the study replicated to get the same result? Neil deGrasse Tyson, one of the best, most famous astrophysicists and like the coolest science guy I've ever heard speak. Right. He talks about the point of science and studies is to be replicated time and time and time again. And each of those outcomes should move us closer towards a place of certainty. We have our science wrong because the more studies that are done, the more uncertain we are about what the truth is. The more studies done on nutrition, nobody can agree if eggs are good for you or not. <laughs> we still can't figure that out right. of how we're testing is so inconsistent. And 
even if we are able to test in the same conditions, the outcomes are moving us closer towards uncertainty, depending on your viewpoint. And this is, this is the challenge with evidence is like, look, if you're going to use it, I want you to give me 10 other times that the study was done and showed the same results. Then maybe we can start talking about this as actual evidence. But until you've got multiple attempts and there is a absolute objective truth and we're moving closer towards the certainty of that objective truth, it's just bullshit until proven otherwise. It's just some very high funded study that was done together, whatever biased information of the person who paid for the study. Yeah. And that's, that's really when, I mean, that's how studies are paid for anymore, especially in movement based or science. Like what we're talking about is it's nine times out of 10, it's someone that has a vested interest in this and they want an outcome that they're probably already going to expect. And who knows what they're, what they're going to do with it especially when you think about like supplements and all that, but <laughs> the, the group that did the uh, neck pain study, the one that has built the foundation of education and information and has given people the right to view it as the cold, hard truth. Um, it was the people who also charge a shit ton of money for surgery and I'm not trying to be like cynical and think that this is whole, like some conspiracy theory. Um, there's some truth to it, but like, I want people to just critically think, just think, think through, like decide for yourself what you think is true or not based on how many other times you can find this accurate information. Who's it done by? What are these people like? How do they view the body and where are their results? I want to see those people. And, and again, I know it sounds like cynical, but um, if somebody's telling me that this is not how the body works, okay, I'll hear you. But why? Show me who, don't show me that you think that it's not right or that you're hiding behind this report. I want you to show me how you've worked with the body and why you've come to this conclusion. And I want to show, and I want you to show me how many times this con conclusion has proved certain. Move me towards that you're certain, not here's this random thing that was done and information that was articulated. I, I've read a lot of the reports. I haven't read all the reports. I haven't read all the studies. There's too many to stay on top of, but I've read enough to know that I've at times early on in my career when I was juvenile and helping people, I believed them as fact and it didn't serve me. And by keep going to the back guys and reading the studies that backs don't heal from this type of injury and this is the quality of life, that information didn't serve me. It was wrong. And me standing up doing this podcast is a testament to it, it at least subjectively being wrong for me, let mm -hmm. alone objectively how it's helped a lot of other people. Yeah, I completely, I mean, I was, I have a similar story. I didn't break my back, but at least with my case, and I think that anyone that gets into this type of field had some horrible injury and they got yeah. told some bullshit where they were like, <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> so I went in and I saw four PTs, three Kairos, finally went to an ortho. And the guy's like, oh yeah, like I'm literally like 21. <laughs> and he's like, oh, by the time you're 24, you're going to have a hip replacement. And I'm like, dude, no way. He's like, stop squatting, stop deadlifting, stop doing everything exercise wise, don't run. And then you won't have a hip replacement. And I was like, I think that's utter horseshit. <laughs> not moving is not the answer. Exactly. Like, again, reductionist approach, like, oh, well, we're just going to subtract this from the equation and everything's going to be fine. <laughs> I, I don't think I've, I've healed one person by healing through subtraction. Yeah. But, but that's how most people manage their problem because it's like they kind of find what exercises hurt. They slowly add these to the do not do list. They're trying to heal their problem through subtraction. The more I take out, the less I feel it. That strategy doesn't help somebody live the way they want to live and do the movements they want to do. It just, it just only goes so far. Right. Well, and I think too, like, who am I to say, 
don't do that. Like, do I really like have the right to tell you like how to live your life and that that is bad? Like, you know, I'm going to try out anything. If I'm going to give you an exercise or something, like I got to try it out first and I need to see what it does, all this kind of stuff. So maybe that does give me some right. But at the same time, like, I don't want to take anything away from someone just because, I mean, if that's how you identify and that's something you love and it's close to your heart, like, if anything, you getting back to that 100% is only going to keep you consistent with the program. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, who's to say, like, me taking that away from your life isn't going to cause you more pain because now you're not doing the things you love. You don't move as much as you did which if there's any evidence, we know that movement does reduce pain. <laughs> I think that's, that, 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 is a, that is a viable thing. There's cold, again, it's, or studies, I won't, it's, we know that. <laughs> You're afraid of the E word, aren't you? I no, know, I am. No, I am. And but I, if you think about it, it makes sense. Yeah, no, that was a great, I haven't, I have a buddy that just, or two buddies that just finished law school and they've like talked about like how certain terms we use and, the English language in like layman terms. And they're like, that's not what that means. Like when you look at it from a law, like the true definition, mm -hmm. and then you bringing that up, I'm like, Oh shit. Like <laughs> that's true. Like this is an actual like law based term mm -hmm. and it's been bastardized. You know, we have taken that word to manipulate, to basically try to win arguments within our field. Yes. Like truly trying to just like, what are you doing? Like, how are you doing this? Like, why is that working? Instead of, they're not asking why, you know, they're just telling you it doesn't work. Exactly. And no. I, I interviewed this one guy and he said, if you can't, it like ask questions like a first grader, mm -hmm. like ask the most simple questions. And if they can't answer you, you know, and just like, explain it to a first grader then they don't know what the fuck they're talking about <laughs> yeah it, it's true man and, and i think having a five uh oh, i'm sorry not five six he's gonna be seven this year like he's he's he hangs out in my office as we do a lot of sessions and he asks a lot of questions and i've got to answer them to him if you can't ask somebody who says you need a disc disectomy you need you need a disc replaced at l4 and l5 because there's degenerative disc disease if you can't say well why aren't the other discs affected if it's a disease why like talk to me like i'm five why does the whole spine not have it why is it just this area um going back to your hip replacement well why does the other why is the other hip okay right that's a first grader question it's a right. first grader question that you are going to watch people stumble because it's the thing that most people actually don't even answer mm -hmm. huh i i don't know why this thing that i've been told needs to be replaced why it isn't happening on the other side and if it isn't why if it is why and why 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 until you see does this person understand it and if they start using complicated terms to like one up you to over you know flex their education it, it's a sign that you should run for the hills. I agree. And, and it sounds like that one of the major focal points of this podcast, which I love, and I think it's necessary is like, how do you choose your practitioner? How do you find the therapy that's going to work for you? And, and I think these things that we're talking about is asking why and having somebody explain it to you like you're five and keep asking why, why, why until they get frustrated that they can't explain why anymore because they don't know. Or maybe they can say it's so damn simple that it just makes sense. Mm -hmm. we, we deserve to know these questions. Definitely. We well, and you're paying money. Right? That's and what I and you're paying a lot. Right. I tell people, I'm like, dude, like, if I can't fix your problems, like, take your money back. Like, go find someone. Take that. Go find someone else that can truly help you. Like, because mm -hmm. you know what? Even if I can't help you, I've probably learned something from this. And that's for me is only going to make me a better, you know, better at my job, you know, or I'm going to really be pissed off and find out why that didn't work or what I was giving you didn't work. And I think going about it, I mean, when I talk about the Kairos and PTs I went to and the ortho, like no one ever gave me my money back. You know, no. they were never like, Oh, sorry. 
you know that no. sucks oh you're just don't deadlift <laughs> yeah thanks dude like i really appreciate your advice and you know i'm gonna go eat my ramen <laughs> well um you know i i i completely agree with you man um 100 percent um there, there's a lot that needs to be changed in the system, but there's too much money to be made from not changing it. It's too much money for that. Um, I, I was pushed towards posture therapy because I kept asking like, well, why does this corrective exercise work for this guy who has the same damn problem as this guy, but I do the same protocol and it doesn't work. What's different? Why? What are the variables that make this person different? And it's always led me back towards posture therapy and, and how their body might, their problem might look the same. It might feel the same. It's coming from an entirely different area. And, it, and if you keep isolating your approaches, you're going to knock some out of the park and you're not going to knock some out of the park. Mm -hmm. And you might think that posture therapy doesn't work for them. It's not that it doesn't work. It's that they had a completely different problem. But again, when we start thinking categorically, that's why some things work for some people and others don't work. Yet we all have the same body. Right. Well, and everyone's pretty much, again, if we look at every single movement-based, therapy-based field, anyone that's actually doing work and getting results and helping people their goals are to improve range of motion and to, you know, make people stronger. Like those are like the two things that are shown time after time after time again, that are going to help someone in the long run in terms of evidence studies, all of that. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think if you're not, I don't know. I'm just thinking of like every <laughs> massage therapist I went to, like it was great in the short term, but it never fits like the root cause of things. Yeah. Now when, when you can feel restriction with your body by doing posture therapy and you can actually identify where root cause is coming from, like, okay, I'm doing posture therapy because my shoulder hurts. But what I really understand is my right leg doesn't work at all. Why does it mm -hmm. work so hard? And it's, and it's less mobile. It just, it's not doing what it needs to do. Then having a massage therapist going in and saying, I need to work on my hips would be really helpful because it's more focused with what you need. But also you understanding it's not going to fix the problem. You can use them to help facilitate the change. It's a tool, exactly. It's a tool. But this is where we get into the next can of worms, which is the tools that we use trap us in an invisible prison so think of like first of all you you can never fix an imbalance by giving the body imbalance if you've got a right hip that's tighter most people will say hey massage therapist go after that right hip go crank into that most people will hold a stretch harder in the right hip that logically makes sense on the surface. In fact, it actually can get results on the surface really well. You hold the, the tight side longer, you're gonna notice it just loosens up and moves better. Mm -hmm. But it's still treating the body with imbalance. If you hold the right hip stretch longer, you're destabilizing one side while ignoring the other. That is going to create a new contingency in which your body's now got to adapt for. And if anything, having a dysfunction in a right hip and radically going after that is going to change the body so hard and so fast that the entire system is not going to understand that. And either you're going to go right back to that right hip being dysfunctional or a new problem is going to emerge. When you work on the whole in pieces, even though the pieces make sense, like my right lower back is tighter, it doesn't go after why it's tighter. And when you destabilize something and you favor it with an imbalanced biased approach, even if you're working on the body as a whole, it's going to create a contingency that doesn't pan out well, either short term or long term. And one of the biggest pieces of, of advice I give everybody in my online program, almost in every exercise, 
notice the imbalance, breathe, and don't treat your body any different. Don't bring any emotion to it. Don't bring any altered game plan or action because that's you trying to fix an imbalance with an imbalance. Emotionally, it makes you feel good. Mechanically, you might get some pretty fast changes. But if we look at you over three months, six months, you've literally put an imbalance on top of an imbalance, another compensation on top of a dysfunction. And then your left knee is going to hurt. That's never hurt. Or now you have this problem that you don't know where this comes from. It's weird. It's new. You've never had it before. It's because you're using imbalance to fix imbalance. And that goes up to one of the biggest myths. And I think that's, no, I, I mean, when I tell people they're doing an exercise and I'm like, you know, focus on the exercise. Yes. Focus on the things I tell you, Mm -hmm. but like at the end of the day, like you're done doing the exercise, you're done thinking about it, like focus on life and the task at hand, because I think people even just like patterning and like neuroplasticity takes effect. And they're going to think about that same thing, you know, oh, my right back is tighter, it's tighter, it's tighter, it's tighter. Why, 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 you know, they get stuck in that positive feedback loop. And I think that what you're saying, I mean, it's the same exact thing, like, it's just, and then you layer on that compensation like you're talking about and it's just who knows how the body's going to adapt that compensation we don't know if if it's going to be a fascial like you're saying we don't know if it's changes in lymph if it's if it's neuro if it's anything right the body's kind of just do i mean the whole brain stem is going to take over and do its thing you know Mm -hmm. it's going to adapt to make you successful in whatever environment you're in and what you're doing and I think if yeah. you just respect that, <laughs> then you're going to be on the right track in the first place. Yeah. And you know what, what I tell all of my members right now is that like, there's nothing for you to critically think about here. There's nothing for you to mentally conceptually unwind. There's no discovery that needs to be tinkered with. If you just breathe and do the exercise, do the movement. If you don't do anything extra like bracing your core, if I don't say that, don't do it. Don't bring anything to it. No conscious facilitation. You have to let the subconscious body, the, the, the natural state of things show up. If you keep trying to override your body with your logic, that's why you're in pain. And that's why you're not getting better. And that's why you won't get better until goes back to the start of this conversation until you learn to step to the side, put your body in the basic positions and let gravity and force and time reteach your physiology, how to work. You can't think through that. And oftentimes it's how we relate to the problem. Like you've got a tight right back. If there's a thought that follows that, so begins the overthinking process. I'm reading. Oh, go ahead. ahead. Oh, oh, I was just saying that, you know, um, how, how you relate to your sensation is just as big of a problem as the actual mechanical problem. Exactly. I'm reading a book. Um, what is it? I just started. Um, oh goodness. It has slipped my mind. I'm the worst at remembering book titles and who wrote it. Here it is. The upside of stress. Um, I started this literally today. I'm already halfway through it because I'm just like been that into it. Like I started reading it, but literally it's talking about how, you know, stress isn't bad. It's a normal part of us. And it's more of how do we manage the stress versus we just got to reduce it to zero. So instead of you're looking at all these like stressful situations, well, like I want to build muscle technically have to stress the system to build that muscle and create a change. I want to create a business. I mean, it's a stressful situation. I have to be able to manage and adapt to that stress in order to change. Mm -hmm. And what the book does is it quotes all these different studies and it's talking about how, you know, people who thought that their stress was bad and that it affected them negatively 
died sooner <laughs> than the people who thought that their stress was something positive. And they said, like, kept seeing this time and time and time after again. <clears throat> and they found that, excuse me, really with all of this, it was the mindset mm -hmm. of how you perceived and how you thought about this stuff that truly it would change how like the types of hormones you produce like in your saliva. So like one of the examples was DHEA versus cortisol in these situations. And they found that people who thought, you know, DHEA is a neuro or it's a, it builds your brain essentially. And like creates new neurons, all that stuff. Whereas cortisol is the other side, which is, you know, adrenaline and all that kind of yeah. crazy stuff. But people who were thinking about this in more of a positive light, or they had like someone say inspirational stuff to them to beforehand, before like whatever the study was, they produce more DHEA in their saliva versus people who were already in a negative mindset or thought that this was going to negatively affect them. They produce more cortisol. Well, it's, it, it's huge, man. I mean, when, when you look at anybody with injuries or has chronic pain, even, even what you went through, um, it will rewire the way that you approach sensation. It does. When you have a life and then you get injured and then don't have that life or at the same level, you start to compare the things you could do that you couldn't do. When you start comparing, you start it literally the next emotion is frustration, right? Comparison is the root of frustration. So now you're having a frustration emotion tied to movement. And when you do your exercises and feel sensations, you're bringing most likely, unless you are actually aware and trained in it, you are attaching negative dialogue, thoughts, emotions, feelings, and words to a sensation. You're making a sensation more than a sensation. And, and how you do that makes all the difference. And I can't tell you how many times people have done the online program. They find something that works, but then it stops working. And then they'll book a session. And I will run them through the same exercises done in the same way, the same sets, same reps. And I start asking like, what do you feel? Um, oh, I feel my right hip tighter. Okay. How does that make you feel? Well, fuck, it shouldn't be there. Like fr it's frustrating. And yeah. it's like, why, why is that the emotion that you're bringing to it? Can we, and this might sound like hippy dippy, but can we like meet it with love? Can we meet it with compassion? Can we meet it with embrace and understanding? Can you meet your sensation with kindness and acceptance instead of trying to just beat the shit out of it, hoping that it will surrender. It never does. And, and just changing the language in which you attach to sensation is freaking crazy how it radically changes the body faster and harder and deeper than any exercise I've ever found. It's I, so that's like the biggest rabbit hole I've been going down personally. <laughs> is Good like luck. biopsychosocial luck. like all of that and yeah it's super interesting but at the end of the day it's the same thing it's pretty it's exactly what you said it's just perceiving what you're doing and matching it with a different emotion because again frustration that's a threat response mm -hmm. you know to the system like if you're upset or it's not going the way you want i mean Think of it as like a little kid. What's he going to do? Like that, like at the end of the day, that's how we function. Like we're just, we're kids. Yeah. Our brain is still at that level. Like it, our cortex is only there to make our limbic system and like our brain stem, like that much more efficient. Like I can think about how I'm going to attack that deer on the Savannah mm -hmm. versus me just like, Oh deer, run, sprint, do it like kind of deal like i can get food better that way but i think it gets us in, tr in trouble because then that thought you know and like the book uh why zebras don't get ulcers by robert sapolsky like i love that book i gotta check that out one it's a great book it's all it's biopsychosocial kind of stuff but it's 
actually Robert Sapolsky has, I mean, he, he's a professor at Stanford. I don't know if he's Oh, still I know his, uh, yeah. On he's, YouTube, he's got like 25 lectures and they're free. I'm, like the most, the best hidden secret in YouTube. Like it's, I'm, I'm on, I'm halfway through them right now and they're awesome. Like I can't say a bad thing. My favorite part about that guy is how brilliant he is and how he's saying, all right, we're going to talk about something. I'm going to fumble through it because I don't really think I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and you are like the leader at an Ivy League school. Right. Talking, I mean, he knows this stuff so intimately. And for him to know what he knows, to say, I don't really know. And he's like trying to understand it. Uh, is, is It's just brilliant, man. Mm -hmm. I can, yeah, it's, I really like how he talks about the research industry as well and how everyone's biases and it's a competition and it's all that stuff. And again, back to evidence, those, they're humans, like those people in the study that created the study, this very, you know, abstract methods, all this stuff, like it seems so put together and so scientific, but at the same time, like that's still a human being that has their own biases, that has their own life. They might have a kid. They might have all this stuff. Who knows what they were going through when creating that study? Who knows the, what the board was going through? Those people on the board who have to approve that mm -hmm. <laughs> was going through. And like how many times it took them to get through and all this stuff. And it's, I, I think Robert, it's, it's funny like, <laughs> just listening to that and how he's, he literally goes through each different way of looking at what is it um, uh, behavioral biology, whatever he calls it and how he's looking at it through all these different lenses and he's trying to use them all. And it's just like, what's most convenient at the time to explain what we're seeing at that moment. And that's where I think we need to realize with the categories like you talked about, like, okay, this is neuro, this is digestive, this is fascia, this is all that stuff. Okay, it might be the best time to talk to my patient or my client through this lens because it might make the most sense to them, mm -hmm. but I'm still going to connect it to how it's the whole system. Right. And that, mm -hmm. yeah, this is happening right here, right now. But there's all this other stuff and not one system is going to be more effective than the other. It's again, like you say, you have to use it all. Like I happen to go through more of like a neuro respiratory system. And I am more biased that way. But the more I do this, the more I'm looking at that as a tool for that specific moment in time when I imagine that it's going to work versus it being like, you have to do this or you're right. not going to get better. Well, I, I, you know, and I think if, uh, because you've, I think you've been through like PRI, right? Mm -hmm. Posture Restoration Institute. Um, I, I think this gives a better framework for the conversation. But e even if we go down the lane of our neural system being the source of the problem and our respiratory system as the source of the problem, there's truth there, no doubt. But then you start looking at, well, what is the mechanical setup for blood flow to the brain based on the body's ability to go vertical? And it, it, it always goes back towards the whole, even the respiratory system for the diaphragm to work properly. The rib cage has got to be in a specific position with hip flexor function. Like you can't have the diaphragm that works when the abs hijack motion because the pelvis can't move you're restricting diaphragmatic breathing or function respiratory function is affected and when people become shoulder driven movers compared to hip driven movers and now they're using their upper body instead of a tool to facilitate motion they're using it to drive motion the respiratory system could be the root cause but if we still don't take a step back and look at how the postural system, how the human being created this condition. It just gets us so trapped and it not only gets us trapped, but it gives us those experiences of like, I can help seven out of 10 people 
eight out of 10 people. Hell, I can help nine out of 10 people, but there's still that one person that doesn't fit into that category. And that, that is my, um, that's, that's my, that's my mission, man, is to get yeah. everybody go be a specialist in what you're a specialist, but still take a look at how the whole body's got to show up. So your specialty can, can express itself to its fullest. Right. That no, I can. Yeah. I mean, the more I've practiced this and like, I see certain limitations and it, there's a limitation in every single, like, and for people listening like this is, you know, you may be a specialist yourself or you might just be listening to listening. But for those that have taken any courses or anything like that, they're going to find limitations in every single course. And if you take it as gospel, which I used to back in the day, it's like, oh, this is the best thing in the world. Like everyone should do this, especially if it helps you. And yeah. Oh God. If it helps you, it is the answer to all of world's problems. Exactly. And so like, even, you know, I have specific pillars where I, you know, practice from, which is, you know, range of motion. You got to be able to be strong. <laughs> you got to be able to stand up against gravity, do what you love. <laughs> like, yeah, those are my four things. And if, Everything else around that, any system that I use is, it's just a tool in the toolbox. You know, I might use a PRI strategy or someone might not need that. And they just need to, I'm sure you can probably say the same stuff. Like, you know, like I'm not going to have them do a full exhale here. I just want them to just breathe. Like, I don't even think about it. Like you're yep. saying, like, and that's something too, I'm going more closer to through my practices how can I make this unconscious? Because I think that's something where I've talked to other folks is we're thinking so consciously about like, okay, this has to happen. This has to happen. I have to contract this muscle. I have to breathe. I have to do that. And they're expecting that to turn into neuroplasticity. But at the end of the day, I think when it comes to, I mean, just how the body works, is it's all unconscious. Like I walk across the street. I don't think about this process. No, you're not saying reciprocally inhibit this and flex it. Right. No. It, it's got to be able to be unconscious. You know, if I have an athlete and they're going to run a route, last thing I want them to think about is shoulder retraction while they're trying to sprint and, you know, like it's not how it works. So I think anything where you can have someone just, okay, you put some thought and then it's just, you know, progress it maybe to as unconscious as possible i don't know i'm curious to hear your opinion on that because at least with my posture training i'm trying to make it as unconscious as possible i want to change your posture to where you just stand right in front of me and it's better like you're not even thinking about it you're not holding anything back yeah the um misconception of the biggest misconception of posture is that it's forced Yes. It's the biggest misconception. And I think all of us have this, like parents tell you to sit up straight when you're younger or like, you know, don't slouch on a date, show them you're confident, things like that. Like we learn really early on that our posture is meant to be thought about the position I have to sit in all day long. We're the only animal that does that. We're the only animal and we're the only animal that has massive levels of movement issues and massive. I think too, with us thinking about this, I mean, one, like, again, kind of talking about Robert Sapolsky mm -hmm. and how he taught things of like behavior and all that, like we're thinking about this, like our evolution is, and how he looks at it is everything's built on top of each other, right? Like I don't really like just recycle, I just recycle what I already have. So like an example would be my vocal cords can be compared to the same tissue as a fish and their gills kind of deal. Like we just repurposed whatever the hell that was from whatever creature that came before us. And I've repurposed that. So if we're looking at it as like, that's evolution. There's still deep down in the, what we are that drive of like, you know, how many years of animals that didn't think about their movement is still a part of us. Mm -hmm. And it's still an unconscious process. I don't know. That was a tangent. <laughs> well, no, no. It, look, man, it, it was a great tangent. Um, 
I, I work with some incredible breath work coaches mm. and I work with some phenomenal movement coaches and the hardest thing to do is to teach somebody awareness without control. I know you can breathe in through your nose and exhale through your mouth and hold it for certain seconds. And mm -hmm. I know the Wim Hof method and technique is, is gaining massive levels of attention. Oh yeah. He only keeps, he just keeps building. <laughs> Dude, he, he, he's unbelievable. And like, there's a lot of benefit and tools to it. But at the end of the day, when you sprinkle away all the cognitive things and overridden physiological things that we do, to be aware of your breath without controlling your breath, awareness without control, to be aware of your body without controlling your body mm -hmm. is where the answers to most of your questions are going to live. To be aware of your imbalance without controlling the imbalance. Um, and that's what I teach people. That's one of the first early on concepts in my course is that like, you're going to lay on the ground right now and we're not doing any breathing techniques because you need to understand what it's like to be aware of something without always trying to inject your sense of control. You don't have control here. Your physiology is brilliant and genius and it does not need whatever bullshit information you're bringing to it. It doesn't. Biased information. Yeah, it doesn't. It Take it out. Yeah. It, take it out of the window. It just doesn't, it's not helping you. And when people ask me how long it takes to get better, like to get the results you see on my page, um, the better question is, is how long is it going to take you to become the observer? Mm -hmm. Whatever that time frame is, is how long it's going to take you to get better. I don't know whether to tell people it took five years of posture therapy for it to work because it didn't at the start the first day was great but there was a lot of complications after that um i don't know whether to tell people it took five years to get better or two weeks because once i was done with the force facilitated conscious overriding and i just let shit go my body figured it out in a way that it never did the more i knew the more I knew, the worse I got. The more I knew, the more question marks I had working with clients. And like, you have to learn how to step to the side, set down all the information, look at the conditioning and where it comes from, why you feel like intensity equals results, because it doesn't. And just start almost like with a beginner's mindset, observing what's happening. Be a witness to it, but don't get involved in it. Posture is not something to notice your slouching and then change because your posture is the sum of your natural subconscious function. If you're slouching, that is the function, the sum of how your body works as a single unit. If your brain then says, oh, I'm aware of my slouch, let me pull it back, you are now going against the natural function of your body based on whatever you think should be happening. If your shoulders could pull back, they would, and they'd be there and they'd be comfortable and chill, but they're not because of how your body works as a whole. So now you have this dysfunctional body that you are now just going to force erect. Good luck before it either hurts or it gets exhausting or you just get distracted and you completely go right back to square one. Yep. Exactly. So all of my photos, every single one of my photos is a relaxed before and in a relaxed after. I know people can just stand tall. The problem is not getting into the positions. The problem mm -hmm. is naturally staying there. And it's about getting out of your normal Deep. Hi, girlfriend. I know she just walked in. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> it, it's, it, it's about getting it, learning what your natural is and working from there towards a better natural.
So it's, it's, it's nothing for us. And this kind of opens up the door for a really challenging conversation that a lot of people aren't ready for, which is um, cueing somebody on their form is one of the most harmful movement things a coach can do. If somebody has a shit squat, 99.99% of movement experts will cue to change the squat, knees out, shoulders up, hips back, knees, whatever the millions of cues. But if we can get a trainer to observe natural movement, what is this person's form and movement like and not correct them? So they now are doing two things. They're now learning that they're not doing it right and they need to think about it. We're teaching them to overthink, but we're also teaching them to override their natural function. It's like telling a deer how to run. It's overriding what the deer knows how to do instead of working with the deer's natural movement in a way that over time gets them to run better. Pulling the shoulders back, elbows back, shoulders pinched. These are cues set people up for almost immediate short-term problems, if not very indefinite long-term problems when it comes to movement. And it's now about like, how long does it take somebody to unwind all of these cues that have been jammed down our throats? And look, dude, I'm guilty of it. I was the cue master when I was a trainer because I thought there had to be this right form. The right form is what somebody naturally is. And it's working them to what our designed form is, which is balance, symmetry, function, full body continuity. Most people don't work like that. And that's why we have to cue them. But we're overriding it. And on a very, taking a step back and objectively looking at what I just said, I hope everybody in this fitness podcast listening to this, hears what I just said, which is cueing, is overriding natural function and creating compensation. And we wonder why people get trained into injuries. We wonder why new issues keep coming up, why we have to stop doing some exercises that we could do and us as the fitness professional find ways to adjust. We find ways to you know, cater somebody's program, but we're only doing that because the way we're cueing is jacking a lot of people up. Brace from the core, tuck the pelvis, suck in, draw in through the navel. These are people things on an ancient design. It always gets weird. I'm, <laughs> I'm cringing and antsy, but it's because, I mean, you literally just hit the point that I was already talking about, which is, you know, it's an unconscious process that's that ancient design that's already there. Like it is curious. I mean, every single time I think of like my cueing and what I'm doing, it's because it doesn't look right. Whatever that is. <laughs> right. And usually that's because, Oh, well something felt funny or something. I think what I've definitely done to try to get away from that as of now has been like, okay, for like, for instance, or for example, like squat depth, you raise the heels up on someone versus telling them to do something different. Like you change the environment and let the body kind of do its thing. Mm -hmm. And then I also just letting people learn. <laughs> like there is a point where I think like a client may have, you know, like, especially like a younger client, something where they don't have the, the movement foundation like they're going to look like a baby deer the first time they squat or they do a movement, right? Their legs are going to be in and out, all of that. Something. Something. Right. So I think that is something that I've personally been working on, which is over coaching, over cueing, all these things. But at the end of the day, the goal is to get away from that. Yeah. Like I don't, I don't want to have to warm up. I'd like to be able to just go sprint whenever I wanted, but for whatever reason, I have to warm up kind of deal. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and, and this is, this is where the major lack of program design comes in with mm -hmm. a lot of people. Um, because we're not looking at why we can't just go. Why? Why does somebody have to use repetitive motion to be ready for motion? What is that repetitive motion that that person has to do? Like, why does somebody have to run on a treadmill to feel like they can then go lift weights? What is that doing to prepare their body for movement that is overriding why the body can't just go into movement? Now, look, obviously the science is sound. Warming up helps. Cooling down helps. That's right. not what we're talking about. We're talking about function. Um, it's, there's no education. There's no information for when somebody, when we observe a squat, well, what are we, what is everybody doing? We're comparing it to what we were taught a squat should look like the book. What does the book say? What do the YouTube videos and Instagram, the guys with the great legs, the girls with the great butts and the guys with the everything that we want, right? Well, how do they do it? And we start forming these opinions of what should be right. So when we see somebody deviate from that, we try to cue them with what should be right. But the information isn't out there with, okay, this is how that person's deviating. Now, how do we take a step back and understand why their foundation is not built? So then I can then within 20 or 30 minutes, go put them under a squat rack and without any cueing, their foundation works. It's showing up for them. The prep of movement is missing from our culture. It's missing from our textbooks. It's missing because nobody's really written it. Because the people who write it are coming from a reductionistic thing. Foam roll before you do this. Mm -hmm. uh, go stretch these hip flexors. You need to unlock your glutes before deadlifts. Well, why are they locked in the first place? You know? What do you think missing. about, I mean, and that's, this kind of gets to one of the questions too. I mean, do you think that sedentary, like, you know, I think what we all see nowadays in like postural deficits, all of that like do you think it stems from like what i'm doing right now like sitting and being more sedentary as like a species i i think that is one of the main variables of why these natural organism bodies that we have don't work well because of how we choose to live our life so i think lifestyle is a huge part of it um like just we'll use you for an example we're putting more weight on the right hip left hips flexed, right leg is externally rotated. That's comfortable for you right now because we've been sitting so long that your body's balanced function is not able to maintain itself. So you shift towards asymmetry so you can stay in a sedentary position. You keep moving because your body's saying, get the fuck up and go move. Stop talking to this lunatic with a neck tattoo and man bun, go move. <laughs> I'm tired of sitting, but we don't. We fidget and we find out how long can I push this envelope? Because I work with people in different countries who don't have sedentary cultures and lifestyles. And the path to getting them fixed is infinitely shorter because I'm not combating lifestyle. I'm not combating Netflix. I'm not combating desk jobs. Mm -hmm. I'm combating people who are farming, people who are moving, people who are doing incredible things with their body for a living. Our sedentary lifestyle is, it for sure doesn't help, but it's a combination of sedentary lifestyle and how we are introduced to what the human body is. These two thoughts, nobody's taught how to take care of it. Just like we're not taught how to do taxes to take care of our financial health, we're not taught how to take care of our body at all. It's not deemed an important part in our education, but in other countries, it is. Physical... PE class is not, it's not educating. It's just an active moving break from sitting in school. Right. There's no education. So I think not only it's, it's this perfect storm of being sedentary and being grossly uneducated with what the body is and how do we actually like maintain it? Um, those two create a perfect storm. And then you add the very complex dynamic uh, emotions that humans have right not saying animals don't but at least consciously we can't see to that level right um, 
as so, I look at my dog who's freaking out right now. <laughs> they're feeling something, man. He's they're feeling, feeling something. something. Yeah. Um, but, He's over but here you, like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> and you're not having another dog bark to him to lay in a better position. He's doing what's natural to him. And he mm. moves when he needs to and he lays when he needs to. But we don't do that. We ignore to get this podcast done. I've been staying in place for almost two hours. You've been sitting in place. We are doing things we're risking our body for functioning against what it was designed to do. Environmental mismatch. Oh my God. It, it's just, don't, don't talk to me about your pain. Show me how you live and I'll yeah. tell you why you're in pain. Exactly. No, I can, it's, and again, pain is just a way of communicating your body's, it's your brain stem saying, dude, what the heck? <laughs> it's, it, dude, pain, pain is, we should be so thankful for it it is your body deploring its full genius. Your body's only telling you you're in pain because you are entirely missing all, all <clears throat> excuse me, all of the other signals. Signals of imbalance and asymmetry and how one side gets tighter and stiffer than the other side. And all of these non-pain symptoms go completely under the radar because we're never trained on how to use sensation to navigate our body. We're only taught to do something when something is debilitatingly fucked up. Mm -hmm. When we are unable to do something is when we are trained from kids to then go do something about it. I think too, you have, because we have, you know, you go to school, you're literally trained how to sit <laughs> and your body is adapted, adapted to this. But, and then you're also adding on you know, especially kids nowadays, it's like, okay, you play one sport and you get good at that sport. So not only are you, have you only adapted to sitting and being sedentary 80% of the time, the 10% of the time that you're actually moving is only in one very specific task that you're getting better at each year. So, and there's all kinds of studies coming out about like pro athletes and how the better pro athletes have a movement foundation from the time when they were kids where they played every single sport that was available to them, which only made them better movers in the long run. Yeah. And I think that that has created a mismatch too. And our, what would be normal, like as a kid, like from the time you turn five and you start going to kindergarten and sitting down, so probably 15 to we'll say 25 when the brain fully develops if you were probably moving and playing different sports and just outside and moving around, like you probably would learn all these natural mechanics just by being out there. Yeah. There's going to be outliers, but I think majority of us would probably, I don't, that's just kind of how my brain thinks about this. Hey, look, when, when somebody finally comes to me, there is the inevitable, well, how long has this been happening for? Show me a picture of when you were a kid. <laughs> we're going to see the same damn posture. Show me a video of you doing, you know, it's like these, I, these problems are around since like early days. We're just not never taught how to understand them and address them. The right. students in the class, the ones who can't sit on both hips. Why is that not a conversation? The kid who's squirming and fidgeting, we give Ritalin and ADHD medication to, yet we're not understanding that we're asking his body to sit in a balanced position. And this kid has no framework of movement to be able to do that. We, we are misappropriately ignoring the human condition and zooming in on these, these just isolated impactful but isolated chasing symptoms chasing symptoms yeah. yeah yeah you're you're absolutely right and that and that's why whenever somebody tells me their story i'm not going to alter my game plan because i'm not going to let you allow me to chase your problem mm -hmm. i'm going to chase the human condition and watch what happens to how your problem clears up right oh well, i can we're on the same page man I'm yeah i think you. so <laughs> i think we're getting there i, I think, think we've only just confirmed that like we're best friends now. No. <laughs> I, I, I think it happened. Yeah. <laughs> it just happened two hours into it. For sure. I know. Right. So we are, we have hit the two hour mark. Um, let's hit these last two questions and then sure. kind of call it there. Um, so 
what would you say is the worst advice you've ever heard? It can be fitness, health, whatever. Hit it. I want everybody to turn up their volume right now. I want you to sit down. I want you to take a deep breath. Stop bracing your core. Stop it. Quit it. It is jacking up the entire foundation of how your body was designed to move. Stop doing it. Um, if you heard that and met that with anything other than why, that is the extent of conditioning that I'm talking about. You might have pain and have braced and have felt better, thus making you feel like bracing is a good idea for you. Is your pain still there? Probably is. If you heard me to tell you to stop bracing and you thought about all the exercise experts and fitness programs that are built around bracing, I need you to put those down for a second and let's go to a fifth, five-year-old's level, maybe fifth grade. Five might be too young for this. <laughs> First of all, building off what you and I are talking about, why do we need to brace our core? Well, to protect our spine. Okay. Why does our spine need to be protected? Because the core doesn't work. Or because of insert X amount of infinite movement problems, mm -hmm. you are over bracing your core because your spine doesn't do what it needs to do, which makes you feel vulnerable. And you need to protect that vulnerability. It's when you brace your core, yeah, you, when you contract your deliberately contract your abdominal muscles, you are holding your hips, pelvis, and spine in flexion. And you wonder why the hips, spine, and pelvis have problems. You've got to take a look at how much you're actually doing that. How much you're doing exercise that does not call for core work and you're bringing core work to it. We are designed to be these fluid, natural human movement beings. If I chased you around with a knife, you wouldn't think, okay, tuck pelvis, brace core, tilt, <laughs> and run, you would right. get the hell away from me in a natural state of existence. But there's something about having a sexy six pack or having a massive rehab program where it's core brace, core brace, core brace. They were right in thinking the core has to be strong, but not right in their execution of core. Yep. So the biggest concept, I think there's right now 112 exercises in my online program that has given these people the results that you're seeing, not one of them teaches you to brace your core. In fact, every, almost every single one of them, I'm saying, relax your core. Because it's when you can relax your core that the true hip driven function, the primary locomotion of our body takes over. Your core is robbing you of natural function. Your core is robbing you of natural posture. It's immediately a resting and suspending respiratory rate. Diaphragmatic breathing does not happen without friction when the core is braced and drawn in. Spinal function is you're almost like choosing a point on a body to not move, which is forcing everything else to have to adjust to that. Mm -hmm. I, I am convinced people are core bracing their way into dysfunction. And they either, no, well, they just don't know it. But it's when you actually learn that you can move without your core braced, because the core should naturally be dynamic enough to stabilize the hips and pelvis and shoulders and ribs and spine um, on its own without the human brain meddling with it. When you can get to that level of motion, oh my God, you are going to notice how bending forward changes. You're going to notice how playing with your kids change how weight, maybe weightlifting is the one exception. Cause if you're going to go do two, 300 pounds, you should probably do that. Right. 
right? You should have some type of protection. Even then to like add on to that, like I use the example of like, okay, hey, a there was a car accident and you there's a car on top of someone and you're the only person and you have to lift it off of them. You're probably not going to think about it, but you're going to Valsalva. You're going to <laughs> and pull the thing up. Like it's a natural reaction. Like yeah. why, why are we making this conscious I think, yes, in training, there is some, and I'm saying this because I am biased, but there is times for coaching and intent, but I think of just, I'm always trying to find a way to stop talking. (laughs) Yeah, it's hard. And to not like use, like just use positioning and use some other techniques versus just like, again, trying to get this to be from a neural perspective, just lower like i want that to take over i don't want your cortex to have to do all this yeah well think think about it from uh for those people who are still listening and are Um, like no no (laughs) no that's wrong think think about it from this let's get mechanical um reciprocal inhibition if you flex your tricep i'm sorry (laughs) if you flex sorry everybody (laughs) flex your bicep your tricep has to relax to lengthen, to allow the contraction to happen. Reciprocal inhibition is a a concept that plays out with every single muscle of the body. It's not that black and white straightforward because you've got all these other muscles that are trying to figure that out too. But when you contract your core, you're destabilizing your back by trying to prevent an injury, you're actually walking down the fastest path to re-injury. When your belly can relax and your hips and knees and ankles and shoulders show up, your spine is protected. There is no meddling you need to do, but we need to feel like we need to brace our core when our ankles work like shit, our knees don't help our hips load, our hips are in balance, our pelvis is twisted, and our shoulders are misaligned. How could you even move without bracing your core? Everything is mangled. But it's in fixing and restoring function to the body, you are going to learn that the core has nothing to do with that. In fact, there is no such thing as the core. Because what we're really talking about is the body. The core is another categorical bullshit way to just start forcing people down our ab programs and making them feel like they're getting those sexy six packs. But what it's doing is it's, it's creating a neural environment in which the core can't relax. The abs can't shut off. People are standing there naturally having a conversation and their core is embraced instead of everything being dynamic and fluid, and continuous, and, and working harmoniously. Mm-hmm. Core bracing is, ugh. It, it, and, and I made a post about it, and it was by far the highest engaged post. You had a lot of trainers get on there just completely trying to tear it apart. But go read the comments, and you're going to see me asking why. Why? Mm-hmm. What does it do? How does bracing the core affect shoulder movement? What does it do for hip function? And you'll see that the conversation stops because those are the questions that we're not asking when we give people the cue to brace the core. We're not thinking deeper than what is this cue actually doing to the flexion and extension of the hips, pelvis, and spine. Yeah. No, I, I mean, like you said, and Ugh. I think of the, okay, man, just just like a yes man i'm like yep that makes sense like sure. I, I hope you agree I, with it i hope yeah, you agree no, with it completely agree because i can tell you like i personally am like a chronic just core gripping like i always want to and i can't tell you where it stems from but it's just always kind of been there and just being able to relax that and let like again unconscious mind kind of like take over this stuff is it's super tough and oh, it's, it's yeah definitely especially when you have it just like patterned in and it's just wired <laughs> and it's again it's something that's preached in every single rehab program core 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 i use a app called trainerize to like build my programs out for people and oh, cool. 
every single video that the guy has made, you know, because it comes with its own library, the first tip is brace your core. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, I don't use any of those. <laughs> and he probably has a great core. Yeah. yeah. He probably looks amazing. And when we see somebody who looks like that and he's telling us to brace our core, of how could a human being argue that? How can basic surface level argue it? But let's watch this guy in 10 years, right? Put him, get, give him to me and let's do basic human movement without his core and watch everything start violently shaking and spasming because this body has no idea how to move without driving from the abs. Mm -hmm. I want to show, I want to put him in a hip function environment and watch him squirm. Yeah. It's, it's, and that's my ego talking. It's a little big. I'm working on it, but it's one of my favorite things is like, let's look, here's, here's, here's the theme. Nature will decide. Nature will ultimately decide whether we say this or that. You have to put the body in a position and allow nature to decide what should happen and what shouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. Nature will always decide. For the people who say alignment doesn't matter, nature will decide. It will show them how that thinking has given their body and their clients' bodies benefit or outcomes over time. It's, it's shown in many ways. Nature has already decided and shown us what we need to do and how we need to thrive. It's just a matter of if we want to like puff up our chest and fight it with human reductionistic Newtonian isomechanics, <laughs> or if we can take a step back and take a damn deep breath and look at the way an animal should move and how amazing they are at movement and how much we suck at it. Yeah. Completely agree, man. Yeah. I think that's a rant over place to sum this all up. <laughs> yeah. Nature will decide. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Man, I really appreciate it. That's what we hit two, a little bit over two hours. <laughs> that was great. Like that was, man, that was a lot of information. I hope well, and this is good because the person who makes it to the end gets the reward of what is the biggest concept that they shouldn't do. Exactly. They've, heard yeah. <laughs> They've heard that and that, hey, it's out of your control pretty much. Just relax and you're along for the ride. <laughs> Let nature decide. <laughs> which, one more rant, which literally <laughs> is how the body works. Like your body and your brain and all this stuff, like it's working in automation like those times when you like drive down the road and then you like look and you're like how did i get this far it, it's, all the time yeah we're not in control like your body your brain all that stuff is doing its thing like if you truly had to think about every single thing you had to do your breathing your temperature your hormones all that i bill hartman he was quoted and he said like if we truly were able to perceive everything like sense everything, control everything, we explode, like we die because yeah. it'd be, just be overload. Too much. Yeah. Too much. In rant. But <laughs> Vinny, where can we find you? Hit me with the plug. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you want to change your life, uh, go to the <laughs> Academy, P-A-I-N-A-C-A-D-E-M-Y. Uh, I've got a great Instagram. You've got hours and weeks of content to go read through um, or you can go to my website where you can enroll in my program and like actually experience what i'm talking about www.painacademy.net gotcha man Dude, you, there the instagram is a work of art i must say it's Thank all you. kinds of i've like i said i've followed it for a long time i've always been curious and your approach and everything but it's funny how the longer you do this stuff, like it, like you said, like Neil deGrasse Tyson says, like it brings things closer and closer together. Like I'm starting over here and you started over here, but it's still like going to the same approach because that's something that works. <laughs> it just works, man. And it works in a way that nothing else does because everything else works different. Everything mm -hmm. else overrides. And this is the, the thing that like, will teach somebody how to be aware and put down the control, let nature take over and heal your damn body. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, 
it's beautifully annoying how long it took to get to that simple truth. How much money it took, Mm -hmm. how much education I have, how many sessions I've had, how much days I've lost to being in chronic pain to understand it is just so simple. Yeah. Doesn't need to be hard. Doesn't need to be hard, man. We, (sighs) We like to make it hard, but it doesn't need to be. Yeah. So before you and I go off in more rants with that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm like, oh, like, <laughs> let's keep going. No. Yeah. Oh, no, man. Hey, Vinny, like I said, I really appreciate it, man. Like, this was awesome. Um, I'm really looking forward to hopefully having you on here again sometime and reconnecting. And yeah, you got, you got anything else you want to hit us with? That's it. Cool. Um, yeah, that, that's it. I've got, I've got a lot of answers if, <laughs> if you're having a lot of questions. Um, and they're all going to be answered within my program. So I just, I highly recommend everybody experience it, but don't do it just to poke at it. Do it to commit to it. I want yeah. you to give yourself 90 days of doing posture therapy this way before you can take a step back and say, what is happening to my nature? Mm-hmm. You convinced me. I'm going to try it. <laughs> I'd love that. That'd yeah. be excellent. That'd be fun. All right, man. Well, hey, we'll sign off here. <laughs>